So, John, this feels scary. Yeah. It feels like the world's in a place that we haven't seen for a long time. People don't just disagree、um, in the way that we're familiar with on the left-right political divide. There are much deeper differences afoot. What on earth is going on, and how did we、yeah. get here? Yeah.、Uh, well, this is this is different.、Um, it, There's a much more apocalyptic sort of feeling.、Um, survey research by Pew Research shows that、uh, the the degree to which we feel that the other side is not just we just don't just dislike them, we strongly dislike them, and we think that they are a threat to the nation. Those numbers have been going up and up, and those are over 50 percent now、uh, on both sides. People are scared because it feels like this is different than before. It's, it's much more intense.、Um, Whenever I look at any sort of puzzle, any sort of social puzzle, I always just apply the three basic principles of moral psychology, and I think they'll they'll help us here.、Um, so the first the first thing that you have to always keep in mind when you're thinking about politics、um, is that we're tribal. We evolved for tribalism. One of the simplest、uh, and greatest insights into human social nature is the Bedouin proverb: "Me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me and my brother and cousins against the stranger." And so that. That tribalism allowed us to create large societies and to come together in order to compete with others.、Um, that brought us out of the out of the jungle and out of small groups. But it means that we have eternal conflict. And the question you have to look at is what aspects of our society are making that more bitter and what are calming them down. So that's a very dark proverb. You're saying that that's actually baked into、yeah. most people's. Mental wiring at some level. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is just a basic aspect of human social cognition. But we can also live together really peacefully, and we've invented all kinds of fun ways of like playing war. I mean, sports, politics. These are all ways that we get to exercise this, you know, this tribal nature without actually hurting anyone. So we're actually also really good at trade and exploration and meeting new people. So you have to see our tribalism as something that goes up or down. It's not like we're doomed to always be fighting each other. But we will never have eternal. We'll never have world peace. The size of that tribe can shrink or expand,、exactly. right? People, the, the size of what we consider us and what we consider other or、mm-hmm. them can can change.、Mm-hmm. Um, and some people believed that that process could continue、yeah. indefinitely. That and, the, the,、right. and we were indeed expanding the sense of tribe for a while. Yeah, and so this is, I think, where we we're getting at what's possibly the new left-right distinction. I mean, the left-right, as we've all inherited, it comes out of the you know labor versus capital distinction and the working class and Marx.、Um, but I think what we're seeing now increasingly is a divide in all the Western democracies between. <clears throat> The people who want to stop at nation, the people who are more parochial, and I don't mean that in a bad way. People who have a more sense of more, much more of a sense of being rooted. They care about their their town, their community, and their nation. And then those who dis who are anti-parochial, and who you know, I just whenever I get confused, I just think of the John Lennon song. Imagine, you know, imagine there's no countries, you know, nothing to kill or die for. And so these are the people who want a global. They want more global governance. They don't like nation states. They don't like borders. You see this all over Europe, as well. There's a great m- metaphor. A、uh, guy, actually, his name is Shakespeare, writing ten years ago in Britain, said he. I think it was him. He had a metaphor: Are we drawbridge uppers or drawbridge downers? And Britain is divided 52:48 on that point, and America is divided on that point too.、Hmm. And so, those of us who grew up with, <laughs> with the Beatles and that sort of hippie philosophy of of dreaming of a more connected world, and it felt so idealistic. And how could anyone think badly about that? And what you're saying is that actually millions of people today feel that that isn't just、um, silly; it's, it's actually dangerous and, and wrong, and they're scared of it. I think the big issue, especially in Europe, but it's also here, is the issue of immigration. And I think this is where、um, I think we have to look very carefully at the social science about diversity and immigration. Once something becomes politicized, once it becomes something that the you know the left loves and the right, you know, it, then. Even the social scientists can't think straight about it. Now, diversity is good in a lot of ways. It, it clearly creates、uh, more innovation. The American economy has grown enormously from it. So, I mean, diversity and immigration do a lot of good things. But what the globalists, I think, don't see, what they don't want to see, is that d- ethnic diversity is, is、um, cuts social capital and trust. And so there's a very important study by Robert Putnam, the author of Bowling Alone,、uh, looking at social capital databases. And basically, the more people feel that they're the same, the more they trust each other, the more they can have a redistributionist welfare state. Scandinavian countries are so wonderful because they have this legacy of being small, homogeneous countries. 
And that leads to a set of a, a progressive welfare state, a set of progressive left-leaning values, which says, "Drawbridge down. The world is a great place. People in Syria are suffering. We must welcome them in." And it's a beautiful thing. But if, and I was in Sweden this summer, if the discourse in Sweden is fairly politically correct, and they can't talk about the downsides, you end up bringing a lot of people in. That's going to cut social capital. It makes it hard to have a welfare state, and they. Might end up as we have in America with a racially divided, visibly racially divided society. So this is all very uncomfortable to talk about. But I think this is the thing, especially in Europe, and for us too, we need to be looking at. You're saying that people of reason, people who would consider themselves、um, not racist but moral, upstanding people, have a rationale that says, "Look, humans are just too too different. That we're 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 in danger of." Overloading our sense of what humans are capable of by mixing in people who are too different. Well, yes, but I can make it much more palatable, palatable、uh, by saying it's not necessarily about race; it's about culture. And so,、um, there's wonderful work by a political scientist named Karen Stenner, who shows that when people have a sense that we are all united, we're all the same, there are many people of a predisposition to authoritarianism. Those people aren't particularly racist. When they feel as though there's not a threat to our social and moral order, but if you prime them experimentally by thinking we're coming apart, people are getting more different, then they get more racist, homophobic. They want to kick out the deviants.、Um, so it's in part that you get an authoritarian reaction. The, the left, following sort of the, the Leninist line, the John Lennon line, does things that create an authoritarian reaction. And so we're certainly seeing that in America with the alt right. We're seeing, we saw it in Britain. We're seeing it all over Europe.、Um, but the The more positive part of that is that I think the the localists or the the nationalists are actually right that if you emphasize our cultural similarity, it, then race doesn't actually matter very much. So an assimilationist approach to immigration removes a lot of these problems. And if you value having a, a generous welfare state, you've got to emphasize that we're all the same. Okay, so. Rising immigration and fears about that are one of the causes of the current divide. What, what, are, what are other causes?、Uh, the next principle of moral psychology is that intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. And you've probably heard the term motivated reasoning or confirmation bias. So、uh, there's some really interesting work on how our high intelligence and our verbal abilities might have evolved not to help us find out the truth. But to help us manipulate each other, defend our reputation, we're really, really good at justifying ourselves. And when you bring group interests into account, so it's not just me; it's like my team versus your team. You know, whereas if you're evaluating evidence that your side is wrong, I mean, you know, we can't, we just can't accept that. And so this is why you can't win a political argument if you, you know, are debating something. You can't persuade the person with reasons and evidence, because、um, that's not the way reasoning works.、Um, and so now, give us the internet, give us Google, you know. I heard that Barack Obama was born in Kenya. Let me Google that. Oh my God, 10 million hits! Look, he was. So this has come as an unpleasant surprise to a lot of people. I mean, social media、yeah. has often been framed by techno optimists as this great connecting force that would that would bring、mm-hmm. people together,、um, and there have been some unexpected counter effects to that.、Mm-hmm. That's right, and that's why I'm very enamored of sort of yin yang views of of human nature and left right. That each side. Is right about certain things, but then it goes blind to other things. And so the left generally believes that human nature is good, bring people together, knock down the walls, and all will be well. The right generally believes social conservatives, not libertarians. Social conservatives generally believe, you know, people are, can be greedy and sexual and selfish, and we need regulation and we need restrictions. And,、um, and so, yeah, if you knock down all the walls, you allow people to communicate all over the world. You get a lot of porn and a lot of racism. So help us understand. I mean, these principles of human nature、um, have, you know, have been with us forever.、Mm-hmm. Um, what, what's changed that's, that's deepened this this feeling of division? Yeah,、um, you have to see like six to ten different like threads all coming together, and I'll just list a couple of them.、Um, so,、uh, in, so in America, one of the big ones, or actually in America and Europe. One of the biggest ones is World War II. There's interesting research from Joe Henrich and others that if your country was at war, especially when you were young, then we test you 30 years later in a commons dilemma or a prisoners dilemma. You're more cooperative、um, because of our tribal nature. If you're, if you're, you know, my my parents were teenagers during World War II, and you know they would they they would go out looking for scraps of aluminum to help the war effort. I mean, everybody pulled together, and so then these people go on. They 
rise up through business and government. They they take leadership positions. They're really good at compromise and cooperation. They all retire, and they're not by the 90s. So we're left with baby boomers、uh, by the end of the 90s, and their youth was spent fighting each other within each country in 1968 and afterwards. So the, so the, the loss of the World War II generation, the greatest generation, is huge.、Um, so that's one. Um, another in America is the purification of the two parties. We used to have there used to be liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. So America had a mid 20th century that was really bipartisan, but、um, uh, because of a variety of factors that started things moving, we now had by the 90s we had purified liberal party and conservative party. And so now the people in the party really are different. And now we really don't want our children to marry them. Whereas in the 60s that didn't matter very much. So the purification of the parties.、Uh, a third is the internet, and as I said, it's, it's just the most amazing stimulant for post hoc reasoning and demonization. I mean, the tone of what's happening on the internet now is quite troubling. You know, I, was, I just did a, a quick search on Twitter about the election and saw two tweets next to each other.、Um, one against a picture of a sort of,、uh, some sort of racist graffiti. This is disgusting. Ugliness in this country brought to us by hashtag Trump. And then the next one is crooked Hillary dedication page, disgusting. So, so this this idea of disgust is troubling to me because you can have an argument or a disagreement about something. You can get angry at someone.、Um, disgust, I've heard you say, takes things to a much deeper level. No, that's right. Disgust is different. I mean, anger. You know, I have kids. They they fight. Ten times a day, and they love each other thirty times a day. I mean, you just go back and forth. And, you know, you get angry. You're not angry. You're angry. You're not angry.、Um, but disgust is different. Disgust paints the person as be it subhuman, monstrous, deformed, morally deformed. Disgust is a, is a like an indelible ink.、Um, there's research from John Gottman on、uh, in marital therapy. If if you look at the faces, if if the one of the couple shows disgust or contempt, that's、uh, that's a predictor that they're going to get divorced soon. Whereas if they show anger, that actually doesn't predict anything, because if you deal with anger well, it actually is good.、Um, so this election is different, and I mean Donald Trump personally, you know, he uses the word disgust a lot. He's very germ sensitive, so disgust does matter a lot more for him. I mean, he's he, you know, that is something unique to him.、Um, but as as we demonize each other more, and this again, as the the sort of the Manichean、uh, worldview, the, the idea that the world's a battle between good and evil, as this has been ramping up. We're more likely not just to say they're wrong or I don't like them, but we say they're they're evil, they're satanic, they're dis they're disgusting, they're revolting, and then we want nothing to do with them, and that's why I think we see it, it, we're seeing it, for example even on campus now we're seeing more <clears throat> the urge to keep people off campus, silence them, keep them away, and I'm afraid that this whole generation of young people, if their introduction to to politics involves a lot of disgust, they're not going to want to be involved in politics as they as they get older. So how do we deal with that? Like disgust. How do you、yeah. how do you diffuse disgust?、Um, you can't do it with reasons.、Um, I you know I think、um, you know I've I, I've I studied disgust for many years, and I, I think about emotions a lot. And I think that the opposite of disgust is is actually love.、Um, love、um, is all about like you know if disgust is closing off borders. Love is about dissolving walls. And so, personal relationships, I think, are probably the most powerful means we have.、Um, you can be disgusted by a group of people, but then you meet a particular person, and you generally discover that they're lovely.、Um, and then gradually, that chips away or changes your your category as well.、Uh, the tragedy is that Americans used to be much more mixed up in their towns by. Left, right, or politics, and now that it's become this great moral divide, there's a lot of evidence that we're moving to be near people who are like us politically. It's harder to find somebody who's on the other side. So if they're over there, they're far away. It's harder to get to know them. What would you say to someone, or say to Americans, people generally, about like what should we understand about each other that、yeah. might help us rethink for a minute this this sort of disgust instinct? Yes, a really important thing to keep in mind. There's just、um, there's research by、um, uh, political scientist Alan Abramowitz showing that American democracy is increasingly governed by what's called negative partisanship. That means what, you think like, okay, there's a candidate, 
You like the candidate, you vote for the candidate. But with the rise of negative advertising and social media and all sorts of other trends, increasingly the way elections are done is that each side tries to make the other side so horrible, so awful, that you'll vote for my guy by default. And so as we more and more vote against the other side and not for our side, you have to keep in mind that um, so if people, on, if people are on the left, they think, well, you know, I, I used to think that Republicans were bad, but now Donald Trump proves it, and I can, now every Republican, I can paint with all the things that I think about Trump. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, they're generally not very happy with their candidate. I mean, neither, this is the most you know, negative partisanship election in, certainly in American history. Um, so you have, have to first separate your feelings about the candidate from your feelings about the people who were given a choice And, and then you have to realize that because we all live in a separate moral world, I mean, the metaphor I use in the book is, is we're all trapped in the matrix, um, or each moral community is a matrix, a consensual hallucination. And so if you're within the blue matrix, everything is completely compelling that the other side, are, they're troglodytes, they're racists, they're the worst people in the world, and all, you have all the facts to back that up. But somebody in the next house, from yours is living in a different moral matrix. They live in a different video game, and they see a completely different set of facts. And each one sees different threats to the country. And what I've found from being in the middle and from trying to understand both sides is both sides are right. There are a lot of threats to this country, and each side is constitutionally incapable of seeing them all. Hmm. So are you almost saying that, that um, we almost need a new type of empathy I mean, empathy is, is traditionally framed as, oh, I feel your pain. You know, I can put myself in your shoes and we, we, we feel, you know, we apply it to the poor, the needy, the suffering. Mm -hmm. right. we, we don't usually apply it to people who we feel as other or, or we're disgusted no, by or right. whatever. I mean, what, what, yeah. would, what would it look like to build that type of, of empathy? Yeah. Well, so I think um, right, empathy is a very, very hot topic in psychology and it's a very popular word on the left in particular. Empathy is a good thing. And empathy for the preferred classes of victims. So it's important to empathize with the groups that we on the left think are so important. So that's easy to do, because you get points for that. Um, but empathy really should get you points if you do it when it's hard to do. And I think you know, we had a long, you know, a 50-year period of, of, of dealing with our race problems and, and legal discrimination. And that was our top priority for a long time, and it still is important. But I think this year, I'm hoping it will make people see that we have an existential threat on our hands. Our, our, div our left-right divide, I believe, is by far the most important divide we face. We still have issues about race and gender and LGBT, but this is the urgent need of the next 50 years. And you know, things aren't going to get better on their own. Um, so we're going to need to do a lot of institutional reforms, and we could talk about that, but that's like a whole long, you know, wonky conversation. Um, but I think it starts with people realizing that this is a turning point, and Yes, we need a new kind of empathy. We need to realize um, this is what our country needs, and this is what you need. If you don't want to spend, you, raise your hand if you want to spend the next four years as angry and worried as you've been for the last year. Raise your hand, right? So, you know, if you want to escape from this, you know, read Buddha, read Jesus, read Marcus Aurelius. I mean, they have all, all kinds of great advice for how to sort of, you know, drop the fear, reframe things, stop seeing other people as your enemy. So, there's a lot of guidance in ancient wisdom for this kind of empathy. Here's my last question. Personally, what can people do to help heal? Yeah, it's very hard to just decide to overcome your deepest prejudices. And there's research showing that anti, you know, political prejudices are deeper and stronger than race prejudices in the country now. Um, so I think you have to make an effort. That's, that's the main thing. Make an effort to actually meet somebody. Everybody has a cousin, a, a brother-in-law, somebody who's on the other side. So after this election, like, wait a week or two, because it's probably going to feel awful for one of you, uh, but wait a couple of weeks, and then reach out and, and say that you want to talk, and before you do it, read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> Seriously, I'm totally serious. You'll learn techniques. If you start by acknowledging, if you start by saying, you know, we don't agree on a lot, but one thing I really respect about you, Uncle Bob, or about you conservatives, whatever it is, is, you know, and you can find something. So if you start with some appreciation, it's, it's like magic. And this is one of the main things I've learned to, that I take into my human relationships. I still make lots of stupid mistakes, but I'm incredibly good at apologizing now and at acknowledging what somebody was right about. And if you do that, then the conversation goes really well, and it's actually really fun. 
John, it's absolutely fascinating speaking with you.、Um, it really does feel like the ground that we're on is is a ground populated by quest- deep questions of morality and human nature. Your wisdom couldn't be more relevant. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.